Hello, everyone, and welcome to Uncivil Law. Very recently, there was a large industrial accident in Beirut, Lebanon, where some chemicals that were being improperly stored suddenly conflagrated rapidly, causing a, a massive incident that causes massive uh, damage within the city. And I'm trying to use void using certain words because of YouTube. I don't know if any of this is working, but we're trying. Anyways, in recognition of that, I thought we might turn to a very similar incident that occurred in the United States in the 1950s in Texas. So this is a 1953 United States Supreme Court decision that deals with liability to the federal government for the storage and maintenance of a similar amount of simil similar chemical that led to a similar conflagration in Texas and many injuries and deaths result. So I don't know what the law in Lebanon is, but we can discuss what the law in the United States is, at least what it was in 1953. So let's get started with this. The petitioners seek damages from the United States for the death of Henry G. Delat. In, in, in a conflagration of fertilizer with a particular base at, a te at Texas City, Texas on April the 16th and 17th of 1947. A consolidated trial was held in the district court for the Southern District of Texas on these facts and the critical question of federal liability. Judgment was entered following proof of damages for these individuals in the sum of $75,000. $1950 still doesn't sound like a lot, but that's what they got. The Court of Appeals, however, reversed, so they got nothing. And we grant certiorari because this case presents an important problem of statutory con construction. So, in 1947, there was an explosion of ammonium nitrate in a warehouse in Texas City, Texas, and some people were injured and died. So, the question is, what is the federal government's liability for any of this? So, let's figure out how this happened and figure out if the federal government is responsible for it. The lawsuits were filed under the Federal Tort Claim Acts. The acts waive sovereign immunity for suit for certain specified torts for federal employees. So rule, num rule number one is you can't sue the government for money damages unless they say you can because they have sovereign immunity. So you can't sue the government for money damages for things the government does unless there's a law that says you can sue the government for money damages. And there is, at least in this case, there's a Federal Tort Claim Act that gives you the ability to sue. But it's a modified ability to sue. So let's read what the federal government says, how you can sue them. You know, again, if this were any other business, we'd be talking about different things, but it's the government. So let's discuss the government rules that apply to the government because the government says it does. All right, let's read on. The act provides that federal district courts have jurisdiction over civil claims against the United States for money damages that occur after January the 1st, 1945 for injury or loss of property or personal injury or death caused by negligent or wrongful act or omission by any employee of the United States while acting within the scope of the employment under circumstances which the United States, if it were a private person, would be liable in accordance with the act that occurred. So the United States wrote a law that said you can treat, okay, just rephrasing what this says. It says you can treat an United States employee like they're the employee of a private business. So if a private, per, if a person in a private business would be liable, will be liable. So we're going to accept the same rules that apply to any private business. But of course, there's some caveats. There's some disclaimers as well. So we're liable, except for all the places we're not liable. So let's discuss the places we're not liable, since that's kind of more important at the moment. Despite the fact that we're liable, here's some situations where we're not liable. This does not apply to any claim based on any act of, or omission of an employee of the government who exercised due care in the exercise of a statute or regulation, whether or not such a statute or regulation is valid or based on the exercise of performance or failure to exercise a performance of a discretionary function of a federal employee, whether or not abuse of discretion is involved. So, yeah, we, we are responsible unless we exercise due care or we um, had discretion. So if there was more than one way for us to do it and we exercise discretion, we're not responsible. And if we were careful enough about it, then we're not responsible. So that's a, that's a lot of caveat that doesn't normally apply in this circumstance. Normally in, in the real world, if this were a private business, the private business would be all of the liable because this is an inherently dangerous, dangerous act. We'll get to that a little bit more. But the U.S. government doesn't want quite that much liability. So as long as we were careful about it and, you know, we had a good reason and, you know, it's okay. So let's discuss whether or not those exceptions apply here. 
The farm grade ammonium nitrate that is an issue here was transported to Texas City, had been produced by three plants activated by the government for a foreign fertilizer program and allotted to Lion Oil, which had previously sold the ammonium nitrate to the Army pursuant to their sellback agreement. The original contract of the sale for the Army having provided to Lion could designate a receipt other than itself for replacement farm grade ammonium nitrate. Lion contracted with Walsam Company for resale. Walson operated as a broker for French Supply Council representing the French government, which has secured a preferential fertilizer allotment from the Civilian Production Administration. Pursuant, therefore, Walson transmitted to French shipping orders to Lyon, who would transport them to the Army for execution. All right, so what you need to know here is what's going on in the aftermath of World War II. So in, in World War II, a lot of land in Europe had been fairly decimated from action, military action, bombing and all the rest of it. And so the United States government is looking for a way to help make Europe better, make Europe great again in the, in the early, in the mid, in the mid uh, uh, 1940s and late 1940s. And so they try, they try a couple different programs, right? They try giving food, but there's lots of it because there's a lot of people that need to be fed. So like, well, what if, what if those countries grew their own food? So what we could do is we could supply them fertilizer. That's a pretty good plan. So we have this farm grade ammonium nitrate, which has high degree of free nitrogen and nitrogen helps plants grow. So we can give them the fertilizer and they can use that to farm and then they can grow food so that they can be self-sustaining. So that's a pretty good plan. So we have this, this whole series of businesses doing business with each other as part of the army. And basically the French government, which had recently, you know, had its lands bombed, would like some of this fertilizer. And so they contract with the company, contracts with the company, who contracts with the company, and so forth and so on. And so the, 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 the stuff is supplied to the army who will then deliver it to the French government. So that's what you need to know. This, um, this ammonium nitrate is being produced as part of a war reparations restorative thing. So that's what's going on at this time, period in time. By April the 15th, 1947, following three weeks warehouse storage at Texas City, Texas, on the orders of the French Council, some 1,850 tons of this farm-grade ammonium nitrate thus resold had been loaded onto a French government-owned steamship called the Grand Camp, and some 1,000 tons on the privately-owned high flyer by independent people hired by the French. The Grand Camp carried an additional substantial cargo of explosives— so that sounds like a good plan. The ship that is carrying 1,850 tons of ammonium nitrate is also carrying explosives on the same ship. That doesn't sound like a problem. All right. And the high flyer was carrying 2,000 tons of sulfur at the time. So, you know, the inevitable occurred. At around 8.15 in the morning the next day, smoke was sighted in the hold, and all efforts to halt the fire were unavailing. And both the ships exploded, and much of the city was leveled and people killed. So, yeah, the, the, this, this, this is great over here. The, sh the French ship over here is carrying about 2,000 pounds of this ammonium nitrate and also carrying explosives in the same ship. There was a ship fire. It didn't end well. It caused the city to be leveled. And a lot of people were injured and killed. Great, great job, French government, on this the 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 mixing of explosives and ammonium nitrate. I don't see any problems with any of this. Eh. Since no individual act of negligence could be shown, which you know, that totally makes sense. If this were private, it wouldn't matter, but or it's not, it's government. So let's read on. The suits for damages that result in necessarily pre predicted predicated government liability on the participation of the United States in the manufacture and transportation of, the United, of, of this stuff. So the United States program is part of this. It's part of this kerfuffle. So the United States government might have some responsibility as part of the chain of how this stuff came to be. The negligence charge was that the United States, without definitive investigation of the property, shipped or permitted to be shipped to a congested area without warning the possibility of possible explosions under certain conditions. So the district court accepted this theory. So the negligence for the United States, the theory of negligence is that they shipped or permitted to be shipped to a place where people lived without warning this explosive. Okay, that might be a problem. Let's read on. 
The legislative history for the Tort Act that, allow, that allows you to sue indicates that while Congress desired to waive the government's immunity for actions for injuries to persons and property occasioned by tortious conduct of its agents acting within the scope of business, it was not contemplated that the government should be subject to liability arising from actions as a result of a governmental function. Ooh, ah. So if they were acting like a business, they might be liable. If they're acting like a government, then not so much. Nice to know. Turning to the interpretation of the act, our reasoning as to its applicability of the disaster starts from the accepted premise that there is no liability to the United States unless they say that, that they have liability. So the government is special. You can't sue them unless they say you can. So you have to find a basis that says you can sue them. One only need to read the law in its entirety to conclude that Congress exercised care to protect the government from claims, however negligently caused, that affected governmental functions. It is unnecessary to define, apart from this case, precisely where discretion ends. It is enough to hold, as we do, that discretionary functions or duty cannot form the basis under the Tort Claim Act includes more than an initiation of programs and activity. It also includes determinations made by executives or administrators establishing plans, specifications, or schedules of operation. When there is room for policy judgment and decision, there is discretion. It necessarily follows the act subordinates in carrying out the operations are in accordance with official actions cannot be actionable. So, yes, there were many, many ways to transport and ship this stuff, as you might reasonably expect. There are many different things you could do. And so the government chose one from its menu and said, we will choose this way. The fact that it was a particularly bad way is neither here nor there, because if you remember us reading the act together, which we did earlier in the stream, you might remember that the exception says, ah, not for discretionary acts. This would be one of those discretionary acts. There are many ways to transport uh, ammonium nitrate. One of those ways might be, you know, just to throw it anywhere. That's a, that's a plan. And so the court, and very rightfully says, yeah, no, you can't sue because they were just picking one of many valid options. The fact that it was a bad option is like, well, whatever, they picked one, so eh, it's discretionary, so therefore no liability. That's a nice trick if you can get it. In short, the alleged negligence from the government actors does not subject the government to liability. The decisions held culpable were all made at planning rather than operational level, involved considerations more or less important to the practicality of the problem. So no problems, that's fine. Okay, so we can't show anyone was negligent, which seems a little bit okay. Let's just go. Let's just let's just work under that assumption. There was no there's no negligence in the planning. All right, well that's that seems possible at least. So we might be able to get that far. You know what is true in reality and what is true in theory are two different things. So maybe it's true there was no negligence in the planning stage. Okay, fine. But the thing exploded. Now, for those of you who are more familiar with tort law. Right about now, you should be saying to yourselves, ah, this is what we call in law an inherently dangerous act. And there's a nice little legal phrase for this, res ipsa loquitur, the thing speaks for itself. That means that in certain situations, we don't need to know how it occurred. The thing speaks for itself. You have done an inherently dangerous thing. A bad result has occurred. Do we care how the bad result occurred? Certain times, no, we don't care. We just know a bad thing happened and you're responsible for it. So classic examples of inherently dangerous acts would be things such as large amounts of explosives or large amounts of explosive material. So if we were a private business doing this, our legal theory would be easy. Strict liability. We don't even need, we don't even need negligence. How did it happen? We don't care. Rest ipsa loquitur, baby. It, the end result occurred, so something somewhere occurred, and you're responsible for it because you're doing an inherently dangerous act, strict liability. So if this were a private business, this would be super easy. You had explosives. The explosives exploded. People were injured. Pretty much the end of the item analysis. So let's try that if we're the U.S. government. Can we try strict liability theory against the U.S. government and get like they're a private business? Can we do that? Let's read on. Though the facts of specific and general negligence do not support the theory of governmental liability, there is yet to be disposed of some slight residue of the theory of absolute liability without fault. If we were a private business, that's what we'd be talking about. Absolute liability without fault. Inherently dangerous act. Storing large amounts of explosives. That would work. This is reflected both in the finding of that this, this farm-grade administrative our ammonium nitrate constitutes what's constituted a legal nuisance. It's a nuisance, inherently dangerous. And it is the contention of the petitioners here. We agree with the six courts, judges of the Court of Appeals, that the act, 
the Tort Act, does not extend to these situations. So that is the end of our coverage of the case of Delat versus United States, a, a classic in tort law that deals with United States tort responsibility and when they are and are not responsible. So I have no idea what the laws in Lebanon are in terms of tort responsibility or otherwise. I, I don't know what that is, but it's an interesting just to, to use that as an example of, well, here's how a case came out in the United States. So a lot of other people might be responsible, but not the U.S. government. The U.S. government can't get responsibility from them because they said you can't sue them and so that's the end of that case and the end of our coverage of it thank you so much for being part of the uncivil law family if you liked this latest video please give it a like below and hit the join button for 99 cents a month you too can give a recurring membership that helps this channel grow and helps youtube to recommend this channel to others we really appreciate your continued financial support and all your love and until later, my friends, cheers and goodbye.